Hi everyone, Brian from the Indie Novelist Summit here, and today I am here with Eloise Jones. Hi, Eloise. Hi, Brian. I'm pleased to be here. This is a great offering. It's really, really great to have you here. Now, for those of you who don't know Eloise, Eloise is an author, a speaker, and a writing consultant. And her mission is to help authors develop and write what matters to them and connect with their readers. He specializes in guiding creatives to write more freely, adapt the mindset that keeps them creating, and to finish their books and creative projects. Now, her book, The Writer's Block Myth, is a practical and inspirational guide and something Eloise wrote after hundreds of hours of conversations and work with writers and creatives of all levels. And since this book has been described as the best book about what being a writer really is, I simply had to invite Eloise to teach us about writer's block. So Eloise, what exactly is writer's block? Well, there's two schools of thought, and I come up with a a third school. One is writer's block doesn't exist. I've heard the statement plumber's block doesn't exist. Why are writers special? which is so shaming. It makes you feel terrible when you're stuck. And the other is just write yourself out of it. And if we could write ourselves out of it, we would do that. And what I know is writer's block is real and it's being stuck and our creative life and our life in the real world are linked. So often it can get back to, you know, when we can look at what's going on in our life in the real world. So, you know, what if, what's going on with our relationships? That how do we feel inside? What is the self-talk that we have? What are our expectations? What are our judgments? What about when we're writing and what comes out is not what we want to come out? Like I have two notebooks. One is my journal notebook and one is my fiction notebook. And when I'm writing in my fiction notebook and a journal entry comes up, I get like I have messed up, but I haven't messed up because writing is really about being with the process. So what I say, writing is not a pathology. And that when we shift our mindset, because so much is about mindset, and when we really get the insights to see what's going on in our life, we can shift how we view things, including our writing and our writing life. Yeah, exactly. I really like what you said. That is is something that is is real, basically. You know, the the uh, uh, the actual blank screen in front of you and the blinking curse everyone uh, talks about. But in in the title of your book, you say what well, you call it the writer's block myth. So why is it that you that you called it in uh, in this way? Well, the myth ties back to what I said about what writer's block is. It's not a pathology. So what often, the way that it's looked is like there's something wrong with you because it doesn't exist, or there's something wrong with you because you can't work your way out of it. And that's where the myth is. And there's also the myth that our creative life and our life in the real world are separate. So when we do things like the laundry, when we take walks, when we sit down and read, These are actually things that writers do. We learn a lot from reading, and our creative mind is activated when we're in automatic activities. It all feeds our writing. Yeah, exactly, and it's it's um, a bit like the if a writer has has two different split lives, basically, like they they live in a right in a creative life and in in a life of the real world, basically. So, do you think that I mean, how can they manage the balance between between these two lives? Do you think they must sacrifice uh, to live their creative lives? or That's a really interesting question. First off, one of the one of the main tenets of my book is to find the ways that work for you. So if you're a binge writer, writing every day is not going to work for you. If you feel that you should sit down for an hour to write, and you've got 10 minutes to write, that's not gonna work for you. If you're comparing yourself to J.K. Rowling, 
when she wrote, you know, Harry Potter. Oh my God, she was on, you know, welfare. She was a single mother. And if you read deeper, she says she did nothing but write. She said her house was a mess. She was with her child because the only way her child would be quiet is if she walked her in the pram and took her to the, to the cafe. And the story came to her. Often stories come to us. For her, they came as a full story, character, plot, everything. Her job was to let it come in and to develop it and to grow. So not comparing ourselves, doing the other things that writers do and understanding there's value in them. Um, the sacrifice is really interesting. I interviewed, well, the book to begin with is the culmination of conversations, questions I've heard, uh, frustrations I've heard from work um, and from 20 years of conferences and workshops and sitting with writers and groups. Um, and I also, to, I knew what I wanted, what I believed, and I knew what I had seen, and I wanted to make sure that I was on track. So I interviewed 25 writers of different experience, different levels, and different interests, from business people to poets. And what I've learned is that those that use the word sacrifice combine it with the word choice. To them, it wasn't a sacrifice that took away from them. It was a choice they made to trade one thing for another, to choose this path versus another path. And when we think about, think of the word sacrifice, what it feels like inside our body. And then think of the word choice, how it feels in our, inside our body. Yes, sometimes we give up things, you know, like time with the kids. It, you know, it may be an hour less. Engage them. That's one way. Engage them. If you have two kids, make the older one the monitor. Don't go in that room. Mommy or daddy is working. You know, and get, you write a story while mommy's writing a story or daddy's writing a story. There, there's ways of working your creative life and your life in the real world together and then at least valuing what shows up whether it's what you expect or not yeah great um so coming back to this basically the the majority of students in our audience are just starting out they've, they've never written anything uh, or maybe some just short stories but they never written a novel so for people in that situation um it's, I think, a bit difficult to understand, you know, I prefer to write in the evening, I prefer to write in the morning, and all these uh, different tactics. So is it a matter for people who are just starting out to try different things and then see what sticks, or do you, do you approach it in another way? Oh, absolutely. Experiment is a big thing. Um, you know, I started writing regularly in a group. I joined a group. We sat in a circle and we wrote to prompts and we read our raw work and then we made very brief positive comments about what we heard. For one year I left the group mute. Seriously, every six weeks when it came to renew I said I'm not renewing and the you know, facilitator said, please stay, please stay. And she told me why I wasn't connecting. And then I asked the right question, how can I connect with readers? And she said, give them something solid to hold on to, something to ground them. I was, you know, a writer of ideas. So I started practicing and I started experimenting and I started, you know, the things that my judgment would say, oh, this is terrible. People are like, wow. And then they told me what they were seeing and what they were feeling and what they were experiencing. So, but it was an experiment. It was, how can I do this? And it stick with it. Um, maybe I used to get up at 4.30 in the morning and write and I, I can't do that anymore. 
So I found another time that writes. That's the other thing. It can change. Find the ways that work for you. And this includes the rituals, like best-selling author Ron Rash makes a giant glass of iced tea before he sits down to write. Toni Morrison gets up at dawn and looks out, you know, and watches the light come on. You know, she fixes a cup of coffee and sits there, and it's about the light about her starting is find your rituals, find the place that works. You know, a corner of the table works. Just make sure it's your writing space and somebody doesn't throw their coat on it. it you know, where do, do you write best? Do you write best on the sofa? Do you write best at the desk? Do you write best in the garden? Do you write best in a hotel lobby? You know, what? experiment, find the ways that work for you. Yeah, and there's, um, I can't remember who it's from, but there's a very famous quote that says, um, from a writer saying, I only write when, when I have inspiration, and fortunately, inspiration strikes every morning at nine o'clock. <laughs> so uh, uh, for those of you uh, listening, I mean, if you get into a writing mode or mood, and you don't have a, the creative juices flowing, does that mean... Uh, you're not a real writer or, or not? Oh, this one about inspiration strikes every time. I'll give, I'll give everybody a tip on that. And I write a lot about it. It's called observe with awareness. It's not just see things, but observe. Look at the details we look past. Look at how a leaf is made. Look at what the birds are doing. Look how the water falls in the sink. Um, and when we observe with awareness, we start shifting how we see. And when we start shifting how we see, we shift our perceptions and things come in. The other thing is, and this is really important, daydream. Do the dishes. Don't judge it, you know, as something bad. Because when we get into automatic actions, our creative mind activates. This doesn't include reading, it doesn't include watching a movie, because then your conscious mind is interpreting. This is the automatic, driving down the road, taking a walk, walking the dog, playing with the kids, doing the laundry. That's how we, you know, get inspiration going. And as far as is something wrong with you, if, it, if you don't feel motivated, not feeling motivated is a form of writer's block, by the way, and most people don't, don't get it because it's being stuck. Um, no, there's nothing wrong with you. Start looking at your life. Are you feeling, you know, are you unhappy about something? Is something not going right? Are you working through a puzzle for work or in your relationship? Are you juggling a whole lot what's going on? You know, maybe you're remodeling your house and something went wrong, or maybe everything's going right. It's just a lot that you're doing. Or, you know, maybe you're a barista and the machine at work broke and you're, you know, so now there's two of you on the same machine and this day that used to be fun is no longer fun and it's not going to get fixed quick. There's nothing wrong. It's our life in the real world and our creative life are linked. You just go back and see how you can shift it. And I'll add one more thing. Before I wrote the book, I started writing a blog. I started four years ago, actually, this April. And I didn't know what I was going to write. I just knew it was time to write a blog. I designed it three times. And what emerged very quickly were the ways in my life that I got stuck or I felt bad or I had an experience that I just really wanted to turn around, either in my head or in what I was doing. So what I was doing is I was shifting my mindset and that's what the blog was about, which is what the book is about, how we shift our mindset. 90% of, of being stuck is, my, is mindset. 95%. So then now it's more focused on how it how it applies to writing. I'm making more of the direct connection since the book came out. 
But that is a perfect example. By in my real life, shifting my mindset, I shifted how I viewed the world, how I made my judgments, what my expectations are. And that works in our writing too. Yeah, so I really, really like what you said about uh, when we do automatic tasks or chores and, and basically the automatically the creative juices start, start flowing. Do you think there's a specific reason for that? I mean, is it, it, can it be explained in any way? Or? Actually, there's a book that does explain it um, scientifically. And it's called The MacGyver Secret. And I can't remember the author's name. I apologize for that. But um, think of the television and movie MacGyver. It's the producer and developer of that show. And he wrote it and he got a sign and he figured out a way to write stories and move through them more quickly. And this was a key component of it. And when he wrote that book, he got a scientist to come in and explain it scientifically about how, you know, like when our problem solving interpretive mind, the left brain and the right brain, essentially, you know, there's a saying, write without knowing, live without knowing. That's what we're doing when we're doing these automatic tasks. We don't realize it, but, when we're in the middle of writing a story or a desire to write, when our writing life becomes our life, it doesn't leave. You know, when I'm writing a story and I get to a scene and I'm stuck, I know what I want to say, the words aren't coming together, by golly, I get up and I always walk to the kitchen. I don't know why, not the living room, I walk to the kitchen. And I may get a glass of water. I may wash a dish. By the time I go back, I have the problem solved and it flows. So much goes on in our subconscious. Let it work. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, um, it's really different, difficult to explain. I mean, there's uh, um, like when you're trying to remember a name or a specific word and then Whenever you, you you stop thinking about it, it comes automatically, basically. So, uh, yeah, and this might be tied to what we what I wanted to ask you about now. So, um, there's a a specific concept in your book that you call um, permission slips for writers. What exactly is are they, and uh, and what, why is it helpful for writers to use them? Okay, the permission slips, we can call green lights, we can call them hall passes. They are the things that we usually have judgments and expectations around. Uh, the first is do the things writers do. You have permission to do the things writers do, which is daydream and engage with your imagination. Sit down and read a novel. Take as long as it takes. So many times we're focused on, we got to finish this book. It's a book. It's a book. Or it's a story. It's a story. Be in the process. The process is where the work gets done. And uh, let's see what research. You know, research, we give ourselves a little bit of a pass on anyway. But how about when you're reading and you're looking, reading like a, like a writer and you see how an author does something, that's research too. Uh, let's see, I, I can't remember, there's another one. Um, there's six of them all together. So, there, you know, find permission to have a, your own dedicated writing space. You know, if it's on the dining room table, like I mentioned before, say, this is my space. Don't put, put your coffee cup, you know, your dirty coffee cup here or, or your coat or the toys. This is my space. Um, to find how we do things. If somebody says, sit down every day and write and it doesn't work for us, it's okay. You have permission to do it the way that works for you. To accept our writer's voice. This is a big one. We develop into our writer's voice. Our writer vo writer's voice holds so much. I was in a, um, a uh, with Meg Wallitzer, best-selling author Meg Wallitzer. I was in a group. And there was an exercise where we wrote 
We did not put our names on it, and then we handed it out to the other members. There were 12 of us in the group. If six of them could guess who wrote the piece, your voice was, you had your voice. Um, I'm proud to say I had my voice. Uh, but only half of us had our voice, and some of them already had published books. So it's something that develops and changes, and it also changes by the form or the venue. It's, I could talk all day about voice. But that's what the permission slips are, and that's why they're important, because it's the way we get past judgment and expectations and the way we shift how we value ourselves and value our writing life and the way that we see our creative life linked with our life in the real world. Yeah, and uh, when you were mentioning writing time now, I, I remembered about something that I read uh, about an author who said, writing time is not only the time when you're actually writing, it's also the time when you are thinking about your plot, when you are marketing, when you... So do you think, that it's a bit of a strange question, but do you think that... Um, Writer's block can also apply to, for example, marketing, like marketing block or? Oh, absolutely. Um, and that gets down to how we value things and how we think of ourselves, um, how we think of that word marketing. What if we change that word marketing to connecting? What if we thought of marketing our book or ourselves as doing a favor for somebody? They get to read my book. They get to read the writer's block myth. They shift their writing life. I've worked with somebody who's an international bestseller and, and you know, others that have four books, you know, published by the big five, you know, in the U.S., the big five, which is now Worldwide Corporation. They, you know, this, was, this book was a favor to them. So what if we thought about marketing that way? So we get stuck in marketing. Oh, I'm not a marketer, I'm a writer. I feel the same way. Everything that's in my book I've experienced. I've had to work through that one. And then one day I went up and went, how many people could be writing now if they had these principles? You know, if they, if they had a way to feel motivated, to not feel beat, to feel like, there, you know, this thing that was inside them had a place to live. So, yes, absolutely we get stuck. And this is part of the real world because marketing is real world stuff. It's not us sitting with the page, so to speak. Yeah, exactly. And I also think that uh, going back to the uh, permission slips, um, some, you know, a new writer must give himself or herself permission to to also be interested in other aspects rather than being daydreaming all day or writing all day. Um, I mean, sometimes it can be turned into a positive attitude as well. So, um, yeah. But another really interesting thing I found in the book was um, like those short exercises uh, that, that are found throughout the book, they are called something easy. Um, could you talk a little bit about those? Books of exercises for people that are stuck, and the words that we use are stuck. Most of us don't go, oh, I've got writer's block. We go, I'm stuck. They're all, they seem to be, everyone I've come into just about is an exercise of just right, or it's an exercise, you know, where you're writing, and if you're stuck in your writing and you're stuck in your judgments, you can bump up against stuff. The other thing is, it takes 30 minutes. Well, if we're really busy, we don't need a 30 minute exercise. So why I call them something easy is that they're five, 10 minutes max. Every single one relates to the principles that I'm talking about at that place. And it's like a process. They're like little processes. They're just ways to think. There's no right or wrong. There's no um, performance anxiety we have to have about it. It's just ways to approach your writing and your writing life. And a lot of it is about mindset. A whole lot of it is about mindset. And it's about finding ultimately the ways that work for you and what matters to you. 
For example, if you have a vision that you need a gazebo like Neil Gaiman, and you're never going to get a gazebo, a writing gazebo, you can be really stuck around that. However, if you find out what you really need is someplace that where you can play your music and nobody interrupts you and it doesn't matter, you know, like where you're sitting as long as you have that, then you're, it's, there are ways of finding the ways that work for you. And there, you know, all we need are just like little five minute, 10 minute, you know, exercises of insight, exercises of being with yourself. And that's what's different about them. Some of them do it, do, you know, involve writing, but they're not like sit down and write an essay. You know, they're short, they're easy. Something easy is what I call them. Yeah, it's often some little things that completely change uh, change your mindset. I remember when I started writing my my uh, fiction book that I had never writ written fiction before, and I felt like the whole story was behind the wall, and I just needed something to to knock that wall down and uh, and uh, and start writing. And uh, and yeah, you, I mean, you get into the mood, and then you find your small rituals that that you start doing every day and then for some reason things uh, start start working and write without knowing follow is um dr o the author um el dr o says writing a book is like driving with your headlights on you can see 10 feet in front of you but you still get there and um faulkner says when the characters show up, I chase them and write, listen and write as fast as I can. Both of them are talking about following the story, which is letting go of the expectations of sitting down to be dis surprised and, you know, discovery. You know, we, we have an idea what our story is. It's like when I wrote my novel, I knew how I was going to start this chapter. The little boy was going to come out. His mother was going to be in the room. And I started writing, and she wasn't in the room. And I was like, oh, no, what do I do now? And the answer was keep writing and find out where she is. Yeah, great. So um, in the editing section of, uh, of our students' journey, I, I interviewed an author, and uh, and I said there are there are some situations in which basically you've got to give up. You you say no, this story isn't working. Is when you're writing a story and and you have what we call writer's block. Um, is there any situation? I mean, are we allowed to say no, this story isn't working? Let's move on to the next. Is this as a permission slip? Absolutely. Um often put the story aside. Put it aside for three months or whatever, go back and write. Um, my, I, I had created a writer's life where it took me seven months to take everything off my plate. I was, you know, I, all I had to do was write. I was in the middle of a second novel, I was 200 pages in, and my husband was run over by a car, believe it or not, walking on a sidewalk. My writer's life, was completely co-opted. That story went into a drawer for, I don't know, like nearly a year. I pulled it out. I went, you know, that story I was telling, I'm not even there anymore. Does it have any juice? I took out 50% of what I had written. But the characters had juice and something else had juice. And, you know, I just didn't know what the story was. The other thing is often when we get to a stuck place, there's a couple of things that are going on. One is we don't have enough information to continue. Like, I want horses in my novel, and I don't know, really know anything about horses. And reading a book about horses is not the same as experiencing a horse or experiencing a herd of horses. Um, it might be that we're not ready inside. Maybe we're writing a memoir. Maybe we're writing an essay. And what's coming up as we write this is not what would serve what we're writing. 
So we have to shift in order to write the piece. And then sometimes it's just flat out, not the story. I mean, author Barbara Kingslaver, you know, admits 50 drafts. Can you imagine how many stellar sentences were thrown away as she's editing? And, you know, it's like, so it's not about how good it is or how bad it is. It's like, is, is the story, I'm, and I use story loosely to cover all writing. Is the story viable? You know, if it's good, Elmore Leonard says, throw out your darlings. I happen to think we need to keep some of our darlings. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> you know, but um, it's, it's more about what is serving what you want to say and how you connect with your reader. And if it's not working, it's not working. Just put it away, re revisit it. Yeah, and I also think uh, that, I mean, enjoyment play, plays a part in it as well. I mean, I know being a writer is a job, but it's not a job if you see what I mean. So you need to enjoy what you're doing as well. I mean, you shouldn't always, I mean, there are bad days, but you shouldn't always feel as if it's uh it's a constriction or something that that is uh it is haunting you <laughs> so uh i think that plays a plays a big role in it as well the not knowing actually feeds right to what you're talking about or or it, what you're talking about feeds the not knowing because when we expand i have something i call um do what answers yes and i take people through an exercise where they think about you know, when they said they'd do something that they really didn't want to do, it would be a no if they felt they had a, a choice. And, they, and how did they feel in their body and their mind and their emotions? And there's a contraction. When we do what answers yes, there's an expansion. And that's where creativity exists, is in that expansive feeling, that feeling of possibility. Um, and so when we let go, then we're in the field of possibility and it can be, you know, it's work. Let's be clear about it. Writing well is work, but it can be fun. It can be exciting. You know, it's, uh, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. And if, if we go on a more extremely practical level, do you use any, I don't know, app or software or anything that, that helps you, or do you recommend anything? Well, we talk about, you're talking about apps like Scrivener and things like that, you know, um, they don't work for me. I've tried them. Um, and they do work for others and they love them. Um, I am a document writer. I write fiction and poetry in longhand, then transfer to the computer. I write my essays and nonfiction on the computer. Um, it's, it's, you know, some people write with pencils. I have my favorite pen. You know, it's, it's my favorite pen, and it is not the most expensive pen on the market. And it's refillable and it can flow and glide as fast as I can think. And it doesn't smear. So it's, it's those are, you know, we find that works for some people and it doesn't for others. So if somebody says, hey, try this, try it. If it doesn't work for you, then it's not for you. So I'm not really the best person to, to ask, you know, about what the really good programs out there are, I will say that there are some real effective ones. And Scrivener's one that people like a lot. Yeah, and this, I mean, this is great because it goes back to what we said before, that uh, you need to find what works for you. You're not, I mean, you can't have, you can't read a, a list of tools that you absolutely need to need to use if you want to be a writer, because like we said, you got to experiment and, uh, and test and tweak. Great. So uh, this has been really, really great. I really enjoyed this, uh, this lecture from, uh, from Eloise. And what is, before we go, the last and best writing tip that you can give to our first-time novelists? Trust the process. 
process, not the end product you have in mind, not the story you think you're writing. Trust the process of the journey and of writing because that's where creativity lies and that's how the work gets done. And there's one other. It's what I call the evidence journal. We tell ourselves stories we, you know, of what should be, how much we should be writing, what we should be writing. You know, we make value judgments. We do comparisons. You know, this is good. This is not good. We get into our fears. We think we don't have enough time. And get a piece of paper or a notebook. And if you think, let's take Facebook. Facebook takes up my writing time. Write down how much time you spent on Facebook and how much time you spent writing. One author did that and she found out, and she didn't want to give up Facebook because that was her connection. She found out that she did not spend as much time on Facebook as she thought and she spent more time writing because she wrote down the five minutes here and the 10 minutes there and she wrote down the, where, the time she spent thinking about her writing and how she had done her research and she had been reading. And she saw that she was more living the writer's life and being a writer than she thought. So go back to real world. You know, do, take, get the simple tools. And this is in my book, by the way. Get the simple tools that bring you back to what's real versus all this stuff we have going on in our head. That's two things. <laughs> Even better. <laughs> well, Eloise, thank you so much for being on the Indie Novelist Summit. It's been absolutely superb. Thanks very much. And I will see all of you in the next session. Bye. Thank you so much, Brian. Bye-bye now.